Hello, and thank you. Thank you for having me come and talk with you today. Um, I'm going to answer a question you may not have had first. I'm limping my way up here because I tore a calf muscle walking to work on August 1st. And I said to myself, is there enough evidence that you should be stretching if you're leading an, act an active lifestyle? Yes, definitely. There's enough evidence to demonstrate that. Was I applying that evidence? Did I believe it? Yes, I was. But was I using it in the way that would have been advised based on my unique activity level? No, not so much, obviously. So I am going to talk a little bit about using evidence, and we'll come back to that example later. Uh, but before I do, I'd just like to ask, um, could you, a show of hands, those who define their role as primarily research or evaluation? Okay. And those who define their role as primarily policy? Diane. <laughs> and so therefore, community. Who is here representing community, community serving organizations? A huge crowd. Great. So it's a pretty good balance. And, and I'm really pleased to see that balance because it takes all of us to address some of these issues and to really think about how we're better going to use what we know. What I'm going to talk about in the next not 45 minutes, because I'll try to make sure you have lunch soon. Um, <laughs> good. Um, but what I'm going to talk about in the next 45 minutes is, is about um, recognizing, yes, we, we know a lot. We have a lot of information about what works, what doesn't, what is needed for prevention. But are we using it effectively? And what can we do to better use it effectively? Um, and I'll encourage you to think in little snippets throughout my talk about your personal use of evidence, because it's a human endeavor. It's people who use evidence. It's not things. And so we have to think about our behavior change and the way we approach it if we're going to be part of making sure we're doing things differently to improve the lives of people we serve. So just a little bit about policy-wise, and thank you, Jared, for the introduction. It's very briefly, we do exist to improve the lives of children, families, and communities um, through leading, creating, and enabling, mobilizing research evaluation. And our focus is on evidence-informed policy and practice. So I'm going to use the E word quite often during this presentation. Um, I will skip over this slide and go to our theory of change. So our theory of change rests on a foundation of trust. And I think all of the speakers before me have talked about the importance of relationship, both in the research that we do and generating that evidence, applying that evidence and, and learning more from the people who are the, um, involved in using it. And so in order for us to do our work well, which is using evidence to inform policy and practice, we have to have solid, trusting relationships with the people that are involved both in creating and using that evidence. We use and have built on a definition of knowledge mobilization, which is a cornerstone of all that we do at PolicyWise. Um, and it's a simple one from the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, CHEO, making evidence accessible, understandable, and useful. And it, there are many, many ways to describe knowledge mobilization. I've spent many of my years looking at those different definitions. But at its essence, this is what it's about. So I'm just uh, going to, t as part of my talk, talk through some of the principles that we're embracing at PolicyWise that help us to be better at creating, mobilizing, and leading the use of evidence. Um, you can't read all of these, but I'm going to talk through all of them. Um, first and foremost, I'm going to talk about the data to wisdom continuum and what that means and what, what it means in terms of how we define what we use to make decisions. Talking about evidence a little more broadly than maybe some of you are, are thinking of it currently. Um, I'm going to talk about how we acknowledge the influence of context and why that's important, how we're embedding 
learning before, during, and after everything we do, so that, as Crystal said, we continuously learn about what's worked, what hasn't, and how we can do better next time. Um, and also about how we're creating our own environment that makes this more possible and encourages people within our workplace to share, learn, collaborate, and build relationships with those that we're working with. And most, well, not most importantly, but alongside all of that, it, we have to continually assess whether or not what we're doing is actually making the difference we intend and whether we need to change that. So our commitment to knowledge mobilization and the use of evidence comes from knowing that to inform policy and practice, we must play an active role in supporting learning through the application of evidence. So this knowledge to wisdom continuum isn't new. Um, you can find it in, in many places, but it's something, um, especially in recent years, we've sort of got bogged down in thinking of research as the only source of evidence. And while it's an incredibly important source of evidence for decision making, in reality, it's a piece of what's needed to support evidence. And so um, we talk about the data to wisdom continuum to sort of more clearly articulate what we mean when we talk about using data information and evidence and moving knowledge forward. So data, it's the raw material of information. Information is data that's been given meaning. And data can be words, pictures, stories, um, but it's using data that's appropriate for the context. And once you begin to give that meaning and understand what it means, then you've got some information at hand to help with decision making. Evidence is a, is a more credible form of information. So it's information that's been assessed for its credibility and is found to be credible. But it comes from many sources. It comes from research. It comes from evaluation. It comes from experience, practical experience, with what you're doing on the ground in community, uh, and also learning from the folks that you're providing services to and, and with. Um, it comes from a knowledge of our local context, where we live, what will work here, what won't. It comes from knowing policy, knowing the policy context. So all of that is um, what we're talking about when we talk about evidence. I describe knowledge as evidence on two legs. Evidence is what we, it, knowledge is what we do with evidence. What we learn by applying what's been done, what's come out of the research and those other sources of evidence. So and wisdom, finally, is being able to apply our knowledge that we've gained over time to answer strategic questions and implement programs more effectively. We do this by not just focusing on the information, data, information, and evidence, but we do it too by, con by convening, as Crystal was saying, by convening, and others, um, convening people so that people can exchange what they know and talk about what's worked, what hasn't. Because the enterprise of research is always pay playing catch up with, with what's happening in the real world. And so we have to find mechanisms to accelerate our use of what's worked and what hasn't. We connect people to what we know of as leading practices or emerging or promising practices. I'll talk about that in just a second. And, and importantly, we have lots and lots of information, so we try to find creative ways of making that information accessible and um, ensuring that people who need it have it when they need it to make decisions. So I'm just going to pause here and ask you, I'm not going to go through the full exercise. This is called one, two, four, all, usually. And it's a, an exercise that we use in different contexts in our team meetings, and et cetera, to give everybody in the room a voice. The usual approach to it is we ask you to just sit and reflect the one uh, on, an, on a question. And then we have you turn to the person next to you and discuss your answer. And then you share it with everyone. 
But right now I'm just going to do the one because we'll come back to the question and your answer to it later. So I'm going to ask you just to reflect for a minute on what you wish people could know that they don't about your work in preventing homelessness. What do you wish people could know from, about your work in preventing homelessness? And please write it down, because we are coming back to it. So I'll just give you a minute there. Okay. Oops. So many of the books that guide my thinking about using knowledge and, and evidence to inform change um, emphasize the importance of valuing, valuing what we already know and making sure we take stock of what we know works and doesn't. And in our busy, busy day-to-day, -day, sometimes we forget to do this. And building this reflection on not only what we know in our organization, but what others know in their organizations and what's been generated is a very difficult thing to do having worked in the nonprofit sector for a long, long time and knowing that it is always the secondary thing that we do. But what we're attempting to do better in policy wise as a nonprofit, it's very busy, is make sure we know what we know um, so that we can more effectively share that. We have a lot of evidence, information, data sitting at our disposal. Are we making the best use of it? Not right now, but we're trying much harder to, to make better use of that. In housing, the area of housing and homelessness, you also know a lot. There's a lot of information that's been generated. Each speaker so far has talked about different aspects of what's known about what works, what doesn't. And there have been amazing consolidations of that evidence. Uh, people have talked about the essential ingredients of moving the dial on these issues. And so we know that. So what do we need to do to actually use it? Um, the, one of the um, pieces of literature from quite some time ago, but it continues to resonate me, with me. Um, it's a little formula that says, successful implementation is a function of the quality of the evidence you have at hand to make the decisions, your knowledge of context, but your also, third thing, your ability to facilitate its use and the use of facilitation strategies to mobilize that evidence within context in relevant ways. So successful implement implementation, a function of context, quality of evidence, and facilitation. I said I'd talk about context and why it's important, and here I am. So many things in the work that we do are not very simple. And the simple realm is where there's a large level of agreement and certainty about what needs to be done. How many of you, show of hands, experience that all the time in the work that you do? So where we do have it, where we are mostly, and especially in the housing and homelessness, is in that we're, we're constantly addressing complex issues. So how do we do that more effectively? How do we use the information we have to more effectively address those complex issues? We co-create the way we're going to show, uh, address the problems, and we make sure that we maximize what we know already. To do that, we're talking about knowledge. We're talking about that evidence on two legs. What you have in your heads 
that you've seen work well and not work so well. So we have to learn from the failures as well in order to continuously improve. And to do this, we need to connect. We need to have dialogue. We need to experiment with what we know and try again, that prototyping that someone talked about, and co-create the solutions. I talk about leading, promising, and emerging practices. I've worked in the health and social services sector for 35 plus years, and there is very rarely something that's as where there's such a high level of agreement and certainty that it's the right thing to do um, in that realm to call it a best practice because things change from context to context. What works in one won't work in another. So there's no one way to address these issues. So I use the leading promising emerging practice, which is getting more and more traction these days. Emerging practices are things that have worked well in a context, but there may not have been a lot of evaluation or research related to it, but the people who are involved in it see the change in themselves and the people they're working with to the extent that they say, we need to evaluate this. Evaluation is key to the different levels here. Promising practices, they've uh, been applied, this whatever has been applied in a few different contexts. The, the intervention or policy or practice has achieved similar outcomes across those contexts and that's been demonstrated through evaluation. And leading practice is the closest to um, best practice but it's still very much about context being important. So leading practices are things that have been applied across multiple, multiple contexts getting similar outcomes, and that's demonstrated through research, and that's demonstrated through evaluation. So if we say we're going to um, influence policy, when we talk about influencing decisions with evidence, what are we talking about? Social policy, it's a course of action or inaction chosen by our public authorities, and it's dealing, usually, with social issues, health, safety, well-being. When we're thinking about applying evidence, it's important that we know enough about the policy process to think about where we can insert the evidence that we have. So quite often the word policy is used, and it's one big P policy, and we're not distinguishing b between different types of policy that actually influence change. So policy can be strategic, it's that vision to improve well-being. It comes out in declarations of human or child rights. It comes out in those kinds of strategic documents. Legislative policy, as we know, is bills or acts that are passed in our legislature. Program policy, many of you are from community, and that's where you are enacting policy. And so it's important that you tap into um, what's known so that your policies reflect what's the latest evidence related to what works and what doesn't. And similarly, at the operational level, how long your doors are open, when your doors are open, on which days of the week, that sort of thing. Those are decisions you make. And we know a lot about the nine to five not working, particularly for vulnerable populations. That's an operational policy decision, changing those things. So why is this important? It determines the kind of society that we have. And we all need to be part of thinking about how what we do can support changes in policy, support the people who've dedicated their lives to changing policy for the better um, in a non-adversarial way. So getting to know the policy cycle is important. This is a cycle that is embedded in each of those different levels of policy, strategic, um, legislative, program, operational. And you can insert evidence in most places around this cycle. It's not that you have to have it when the problem identification takes off or when the policy analysis is done. There is always an opportunity to bring forward new evidence 
and to inform that, especially if people embrace the continuous improvement approach to policy development. So this is, this is where I'm going to get back to that question pretty soon. Not this slide, the next one. Um, so there's also um, many different ways in which evidence is used. And that can be direct or indirect. So decision making, you very obviously using evidence, or using evidence to affect our understanding of a problem. We may not be applying it to a specific policy or practice change right now, but we're changing the way people think. Um, there's many degrees of, of awareness of what, we're, what research we're using or not. That's conscious or unconscious use of evidence. Sometimes when something's been around so long, we just take it at, at face value and don't think about whether or not it's still true. And so being a little more conscious about your application of evidence is a very important thing. It can be used to inform and or support um, existing thinking. So inform different ways of thinking about an issue or problem, or support existing thinking if it's demonstrating that what's being done is really working, that achievement of the desired outcomes thing. And of course, we talk about immediate or future use of it. Sometimes, especially in government, immediate use is happening all the time. <laughs> but the one thing to, uh, that I was told a long, long time ago when I was getting involved in policy was if you've got a good idea or you see that there's something that really may not be the right time, the right policy window, the right opportunity to apply it now, put it down on paper, draw it up, describe it, have it ready when the policy window opens. So continually putting your evidence together when you can use it is the way to go. So getting back to, so why don't we use the evidence that it's hand, that's at hand? I said early on, oops, sorry, um, I said early on, I'm really constrained when I can't move my hands around. So, so that was just one opportunity there that I had. Um, so I said early on that the use of evidence is a human endeavor. It's people who use evidence. So what do we have to do to encourage people to use evidence? My example was I've, I, I pulled a muscle or I tore a muscle in my leg. I was actually a physio in my first career. I know this stuff. The evidence isn't a surprise to me, but I still didn't use it in the way that I should have. So I thought about the evidence, I knew it. I, it connected with my values of staying healthy and being active. I was somewhat in denial that there was any issue for me specifically. So I wasn't as passionate about stretching emotionally as I should have been. So my behavior didn't change. So what's below the waterline when we're thinking about trying to improve the use of evidence is we have to connect first with people's, the way they think, their emotions and their values um, before any change is going to happen. And then maybe we'll see behavior change. Maybe we'll see change in outcomes. But if we don't do the below the waterline work and do it well, then we can just be frustrated with no change because that's what's going to happen. So what I encourage us to do is to think a little bit more about our strategy related to using evidence and not just think about putting a good report in front of people. It's not going to change behavior. You have to personally connect. It's that people-to-people -people connection. It's the people to leading practice, showing that this has worked and where and why. And it's that giving them the information too. So at PolicyWise, one of the things that we're getting better at is really embracing the culture of learning within the work that we do. We're all pretty type A kind of people. We really want to do well. We want to do good work. Um, we've got a lot of education between us. But sometimes that hampers learning. 
we, we think we have a level of expertise and knowledge that's sufficient to carry us forward. But we have to keep learning, and that's what we're really focusing on now. And learning and sharing are essential to make this work well. I think this is somewhat redundant. I've said this before, but quality of evidence is just one thing that influences the decision to apply. And don't get hung up on whether it's perfect. Bring people together, talk about it, pick out the flaws, choose a way forward that works for everyone. <clears throat> so we're creating environments in our organization that embrace change management. So I've just put this up, it's not intended that you read it, but we're really working through making sure that all staff are more aware of what is important, have the knowledge um, that they need in order to use evidence differently. They're committed to it, so that's addressing those below the waterline things, values, thinking, and emotions. And it becomes embedded in their day to day. And I know from practice in many, many contexts, this doesn't happen without commitment to it. Doesn't happen without leadership um, taking it on and helping to move it forward. Doesn't happen without supporting people to develop the competencies to do this well. So we're building it into our performance management work to make sure there's the competencies related to sharing, learning, building relationships. Our organization needs to be set up in ways that help facilitate people using those skills. And above all, we're committed to the relational nature of evidence work. So, I'm close to wrapping up here, but what I'd like you to do in the next minute is just dot, jot down maybe two minutes. Three things that you learned today, so far, because you've got a whole afternoon of learning to come. Two actions you will take in the next three months. And one thing you want to learn more about. This again is something we do when people are going to a conference or um, learning something new through their prof professional development. We ask them to do this um, and actually bring it back and share. So sometimes we, in other venues, we've asked people to write it down, put it in an envelope, and we mail it back to them three months later to see if they actually did it, um, and to tweak their memory that they committed to something. But it's just a simple exercise to help commit to learning. I'm in the way of lunch, so I'm calling it short. Another thing that we use, and again, it's about the commitment to learning organization. We've really embraced the after action review, or the, as we affectionately call it, the R. <laughs> um, so the after action review is something we do after anything, uh, any projects finished, sometimes midway through projects, um, when we've written a report, it's when we've applied for funding, those sorts of things, to see if we can improve how we've done things in the past. So we ask ourselves these simple questions. What was supposed to happen? What actually happened? Why was there a difference? And what will we do differently next time? So again, that's building that culture of learning into what we do. It's using our evidence from practice to help us move forward and improve. Oops, I missed that, didn't I? I didn't click. There it is, the after action review. So you likely cannot read this. Um, it says, review the monitoring data. Why bother? We're going fine. 
and down below it says, remember, monitoring and evaluation information is useful only if it is used. So we have committed to constantly looking at how we're doing, what we're doing, and how we can improve. And the after action review was just a simple example of that. So from the teams in Edmonton and Calgary, thank you. Thank you for having me here. And there's our contact information if you'd like. Thank you. Um, any questions? That was a uh, dump of information. I'm happy to stay around and, and answer questions too. So. You're a good question asker. Every organization needs you. <laughs> well, I always look around first because I ask too many anyway. Unconscious bias. How can you deal with that in the course of dealing with evidence? I, w I went, to, and Diane was there yesterday. Um, I went to um, a workshop put on by Steve Patty at the, um, for the Alberta Coalition of Women's Shelters yesterday morning. And he talked about some of his premises related to evaluation, which are just lovely and don't have them all in front of me. But one of the things he called out is that um, challenging the way we already think. Um, and one of his premises was uh, stories are just that. They're stories. And we need to, re our stories are just that. They're our stories. And so recognizing that we need to reflect on how we came to, as uh, Alina did earlier in her presentation, how she came to where she is doing the research she is um, and acknowledge that where we're coming from and so to do it explicitly you're not asking people to just uh, depending on people to do it without prompting it gets back to that need to facilitate behavior change it needs to be something that you encourage people to do in more formal ways within the table where you're having conversations about something um, a lot of my research background is in collaboration and partnership among community organizations. One of my favorite authors is from the University of Strathclyde in, in Scotland. And one of the things that she talks about as a pretty consistent barrier to collaboration and moving new projects forward and um, doing it collaboratively is this unconscious bias or the things that are under the table and not on the table from each organization. And so she has a facilitation strategy that's really about being um, explicit early on in this collaborative venture about why you're at the table, what it is you as an individual want to gain, what it is your organization wants to gain from being part of that, and then what are the collaborative aims that you can all buy into so that's, you know, there's many different strategies for using that. I find that one pretty exceptional in getting through some of that unconscious stuff. Yeah. You're welcome. And one more question if we have time. Or, or is there uh, another question? <laughs> we have time for one more. Well, thank you. <laughs>